Welcome to Series 43, everyone. Sincere apologies for how late this is coming out. Um, I had some surgery this week, and Ryan is in the middle of selling his house and packing up to move into a different house. We always try our best to get everything out on time, um, but sometimes life is just life. So on that note, I want to be upfront. <laughs> Please note that it may continue this way just for a couple weeks um, as Ryan navigates his home sale slash move. And I have surgery on my other hand later this month. So, um, you know, we're going to do our best, obviously, to get everything out to you on time. But it, sometimes, you know, it it is what it is. We, we take making this show really seriously, um, just the making it part, not obviously like, you know, anything we do on the show, but making it. Um, we, we are also just people, you know, with houses and wrists, so your, your patience is appreciated. Announcements. It is officially International Podcast Month. Ryan usually has a ton of stuff to say about that um, and about all of the great shows that'll be out this month, but he did not give me any specific notes about it. So, you know, you get what you get, which is, unfortunately, life kept me too frazzled to really participate, but I know that there are a ton of amazing folks who worked on projects for this month. You can go to internationalpodcastmonth.com or at PodMonth on Twitter to learn more. Their pinned tweet right now has links to all the different places that you can find episodes. Um, we can put a link to that in the show notes um, and to the website. So you can find everything there. There's not a lot else to tell you right now, um, but you can hear more of my lovely voice after the episode when I do our call to action. For now, please enjoy this episode and this series, which I think might have reached the ultimate Ryan and Amelia energy. So, enjoy! Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome Cam Banks, designer of the game we are covering this series, Cortex Prime, a modular RPG toolkit. Cam, welcome to Character Creation Cast. We are very excited that you are joining us today. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, about the projects that you're working on, um, and where people can find you online? Yep. Uh, I am a New Zealand game designer. I did live in the United States for 22 years, so I have stuck myself with the accent of a hybrid New Zealander and American. So no one <laughs> no one believes me anymore where I'm from. I just sound like this. So um, <laughs> uh, you can find me online on Twitter at Boy Monster and on Instagram at Rusty Sellsword. I'm also on numerous discords and other websites showing up to annoy people about Cortex Prime whenever I can. <laughs> My current project where um, we're developing at Fandom Tabletop is Tales of Zadia, the Dragon Prince role-playing game, mm. which mm -hmm. we're all very excited about. Um, upcoming projects include the Legends of Grayskull Masters of the Universe role-playing game and other things we can't talk about yet. Secrets. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. That's a lot of cool stuff as it is, though. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it keeps me busy. That's for sure. Yeah, it sounds like it. Imagine, yeah. It's like not a small list of things <laughs> to work on. <laughs> well, uh, let's go ahead and get into this, and we'll start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? Usually we ask what sort of setting the game uses. Obviously, Cortex Prime does not use a setting, or at least not start out with one. Um, so it's a bit different. Can you give us the elevator pitch for this game? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, I had to think about this when I was working on it. So 
the, what I came up with was that it's a truly multi-genre modular role-playing toolkit system, which sounds like a lot of words for a big box of Lego that you can throw together and make RPGs out of. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what sort of tools then we, do we need to actually uh, play this game or, or create characters in this game? Well, to play the game, you're going to need a lot of dice, so many dice, all the dice. Uh, you can take any <laughs> dice uh, you have and throw the d20s out because we don't use those. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so most of the dice, actually, not right. all yeah, of them. Most of the dice. <laughs> d20s um, have had their time. It's true. And <laughs> you're over now. <laughs> many other games use d20s, and we love them, and that is fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you also will need... Uh, some plot point tokens. These can be coins or beads, or um, I've often used poker chips, other kinds of things. These are to track your plot points, which are like bennies or fate points or anything else you've probably seen in other games. Hmm. And highly recommend something to keep notes on for sure. Uh, we actually at Fandom Tabletop have been trying to develop these games as simultaneous launch digital and analog so um everything that we come out with is going to have online tools as well as the standard physical books that you'll find in stores and other places oh very nice that's really nice because i know increasingly i shouldn't say increasingly um almost entirely in the last four-ish years um i have only played online other than at conventions and Mm -hmm. then obviously in the last two years only online um Mm -hmm. (laughs) because nobody goes anywhere anymore um and it's frustrating because there are a lot of games that are very specifically like you have to be here in person to do all of this passing of the things. And, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, while I think that those are really cool mechanics, um, most of my friends live far away. So even if COVID was not a thing, um, those are people that I only see like twice a year. So I I want the ability to be able to play online and do those things with people that I love that are Mm -hmm. far away. (laughs) Yeah. And it's nice that you make it easier. When I got the book, the digital version, um, I, w- I was surprised to see the the web page interface mm-hmm. for the book. Uh, and I thought it was fantastic uh, to be able to have all the hyperlinks and, and everything there and and to be able to navigate the book through a, through a, a web interface, which uh, I don't think I've seen before uh, outside of maybe like Roll20. With, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I think Burn the compendium Bright. for Burn Bright, but even that isn't like the same kind of searchable right. thing that this is with the downloads like right yeah. in the um, in the book and everything too, which is yeah. really nice. Yeah, so that was really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's also like people who want to, um, if they have only limited online ability, like if they can't be constantly looking through things on their phone or uh, a laptop uh, with a Wi-Fi, we can, you can download the PDF from that site too if you've mm-hmm. already got the book. Mm-hmm. So there's multiple ways for you to access it. That was a huge part of what we wanted to do going into it before launch. You know, we did not want anyone to have a problem interacting with the game. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I do think that that's nice that it's both online and like in a PDF though, because I know there are times where like trying to pull a PDF up on my phone and like sit there and scroll through it and everything is really difficult, whereas a web page is almost easier sometimes. Um, so it was nice to have both. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So Cortex Prime is a game, but it's also a toolkit for making your own game. We have noticed in a lot of cases that games despite being quote-unquote generic um they're still designed to tell certain kinds of stories or they work best on certain kinds of stories do you think that there are certain stories that cortex prime is best at yeah i do actually um i think although you can bring a lot of tropes from various kinds of genres to it one of the things that does tend to happen with cortex prime games is that they are very i would say the word cinematic is often used a lot um but Mm. i I think that inspired by media is a better way of doing it so they they resemble or they kind of feel like you're on a tv show you're you're part of a a movie sort of style universe or Mm -hmm. um, even visual media like comic books would which we do with marvel heroic the emphasis is always on capturing that feeling of being in a, an immediate franchise of some kind, right? So a lot of the words and terms we use, like scenes and um, 
you know, beats and so forth have their origin in film, TV, other kinds of media. Um, I mean, you can have pretty gritty, dry, um, dark sorts of games with Cortex Prime as well as lighthearted, you know, humorous ones, but they're all going to feel a little bit more like we're adapting media as opposed to being like a, you know, like a war game with, with miniatures and things, which I think is a different yeah, kind sure. of scope. Yeah. I mean, I did notice um, in looking at like what the system has been used for in the past in like older versions. And then of course, even in the things that you mentioned um, that they are all um, like movie and TV property adaptations for a lot of the, a lot of the games that are kind of using the system as the base. So yeah, it seems like it works pretty well for that. <laughs> it tends to be what licenses are though. Honestly, um, if you go out to seek a license, it's going to be for a movie or TV or uh, books or something. So yeah, sure. that, that's that, that absolutely fit into the creation of Cortex Prime as it is now. So it does show a lot of the signs of its of its earlier editions. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so what makes uh, Cortex Prime unique from other uh, generic games or, or toolkits that are kind of out there? I think the big difference is that Cortex Prime has scaffolding in place to remove almost every kind of stat or trait or or even uh, rules procedure and replace it with something else uh, while still remaining at the very heart of it um, a dice pool game with dice as traits. So there's a lot of that. You can tell it's Cortex Prime because of the way that we do things with plot points and so on, but you can mod so much more in this game than you can in other uh, so-called generic games because those at least have you know a much more uh, detailed or robust um, heart to it where yeah. mm-hmm. i'm i'm of the sort of mindset that i can throw a lot of that out um i don't really need that <laughs> yeah. um yeah and that that makes things a little bit different you you only have to look back at certain um adaptations of things before to see that in some cases you couldn't really play a character from one cortex game in another cortex game even though it may feel similar because all the rules were used in different ways Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah i think that's uh that makes it a lot different it it really is much more of a toolkit than it is a let's take these rules and 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 make it work for this thing which i think is even like the the ogl and the 20 and so on it always felt like dnd even though you're Mm -hmm. you know playing in uh, firescape or whatever uh-huh. All right. That is a pet peeve that I have. I could, I could talk about that for like hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Not everything fits into D&D. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's true. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this game because this, is, this isn't this is Cortex. It's Cortex Prime. Mm-hmm. There already was a Cortex and a Cortex Plus. Right. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about like where Cortex Prime came from and how it came to be what it is now? Well, I think that we can call everything Cortex to make it easier. Um, but Cortex sure. Prime, well, I mean, that's why I've, I've had to try to get this down to the point where people don't have to use multiple different terms for things because it gets um, confusing. Cortex Prime is the is the current state of of the system and the toolkit, and that's the book and everything else. But if you build something from it, it will be a Cortex game, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, Cortex came originally from, uh, well, it predates even the thing that it came from. Um, there was a game called Sovereign Stone that was put out by uh, Sovereign Press um, back in the 90s. And it was a fantasy world that was created by Tracy Hickman, Margaret Weiss, Larry Elmore, um, Don Perrin, and a few other folks, uh, Lester uh, Smith. They made a world that was fantasy and it was different, and then they used a system that had never been used before, which was um, all of the stats were rated with dice from D4s or D even D2s all the way up to D20s, mm. even in that case. And that was that was that kind of worked out okay, but when the D20 system came along, uh, they converted the whole thing over to D and D, and it became uh, its own thing. It's just another D and D setting. In the meantime. Margaret's company decided that it wanted to license Serenity, the movie, not Firefly, the TV show. It's a very complicated difference in licenses there. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Uh, So Serenity, the movie, was licensed, and that was, uh, for for that, um, Jamie Chambers created uh, the Cortex uh, rules for that. They didn't call them Cortex at the time because that was just, it was just the rules for Serenity. 
And a lot of us worked on that. Um, I was at the time mostly focused on Dragonlance while working at Margaret's company, but uh, soon after we started branching out to other things. We did Battlestar Galactica, and we got Supernatural, and I had more of a role in those as mm. uh, things went on until I was lead developer and lead uh, designer for Margaret Weiss Productions on all the games. I think at the point when we acquired Smallville and Marvel Heroic, no, Smallville and Leverage, uh, I decided that I wanted to change it from being Cortex, which was more or less like it is um, in Serenity and Battlestar Galactica, very much kind of a sort of like a, a cinematic unisystem, Savage Worlds kind of standard game mm-hmm. with, you know, the way it played to just break it down into little bits and rebuild it for both those properties. So for Smallville, it was radically different. It had uh, relationships and values as stats. It was very strange and dramatic and, and extremely focused on um, your play group being potentially not only the heroes, but also the villains, and you all work together and so on, because it was based on a CW TV show. And then mm-hmm. for Leverage, I did the same thing, but it rebuilt it up for a heist uh, kind of genre, the TV show Leverage, John Rogers and... Um, those folks at, at uh, Electric Entertainment really loved that show and that 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 sort of feel of of a kind of quick, uh, high action, very simple kind of game. And but it still used Cortex for that too. So that version of the system that I was using was called Cortex Plus, where a lot of the mm. things from Cortex, the previous one, the classic Cortex, we we tossed out. We didn't use D2s anymore. We um, didn't add up all the dice. We just added the two dice. And there are other things that came out of it that were that you see now in Cortex Prime that didn't actually exist prior to that. So, yeah. And then after that, a few more games. Marvel Heroic was my, my, my dream job. I loved working on that property. It was amazing for the year and a half that we were publishing. <laughs> 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 and then... There was a bit of a period of time where there was Firefly. We finally got the license for Firefly, but not the license for Serenity. Mm-hmm. So again, <laughs> and that was the last game that was published by Margaret Weiss Productions. Um, after that, Margaret uh, licensed out the whole shebang, all the rules and everything else to me, minus any license uh, property to create Cortex Prime. And uh, I kickstarted that 2017. I took forever to put it out and in the meantime i moved back to new zealand so that was even more interesting but Mm. uh fandom bought all of cortex from margaret and they brought me on board as a creative director and then we put the game out last year and it was only uphill from there wonderful uh, amazing uh track six success for for cortex oh very nice so was the uh, jump from all those different type of genres and different gameplay styles, but using the same base system, kind of the inspiration to go into Cortex Prime as like a full toolkit? Yeah, actually, people, um, even back in the classic days, we put out a book called the Cortex um, uh, Prime Rule System or something. It was more or less the the system as it was at the time with the license stripped out and some conversations about how to make your own characters and things, but it was still, you still use all the same stats. You still had the same skill list and so on. Mm. It wasn't like they had done much more than just take the license off it. People were asking and hacking and modding the Cortex plus games for their own stuff. You know, they were running uh, glee with Smallville, for example, or they were doing DC oh. comics for Marvel <laughs> Road. Yeah. That, that was a huge weirder thing for me to see that being run at a convention. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so, uh, but, but that was the kind of inspiration for then uh, we put out a book of the Cortex plus hackers guide, which was just full of little hacks that people had come up with and mini settings and things. Um, and when I got the license to, to do something with the rules after that, I thought I really want to bring everything together, not just all the plus games and all the rules and things, but also even the classic stuff and kind of create this Uber version of it. Um, and that's why I called it Cortex Prime. It's the prime version of all of the stuff we've done. And in the process, had to iron out a lot of wrinkles and get a lot of help from my amazing editor, Amanda Valentine, to make it all coherent. And um, yeah, and the book itself, now that it's been put out by fandom, is absolutely gorgeous. I think the the art direction from Tina Lam Collier is a next level. And uh, we've got a lot of amazing artists to make the whole book look really cool. Makes mm-hmm. it easier to read and not just a big dry textbook. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's an absolutely beautiful book. Absolutely. Um, I think you got, uh, well, I know for a fact that you got many any nominations for the art too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was a huge thrill the other day. Yeah, that's right. Um, we got six nominations for the book and one for the Tales of Zadia Primer, which isn't even the game yet. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to seeing how that plays out later. Yeah, no, I know my kids are begging me to run that one because we just finished watching all of Dragon Prince. So um, I'm going to have to, like, you know, get good at it and <laughs> try and run it for them. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask, though, what kind of things did you have to think about in, in changing, you know, because this is – Cortex has been – a, a system for so long when you finally sat down to do it as cortex prime as its own thing yeah um what kind of like updates and changes did you have to make just to kind of um i don't want to say comply isn't really the right word but to like stay in step with the things that have changed in the rpg community in that many years because you know like we've we've moved away significantly in a lot of places from like a d20 system and right. just like the kinds of games that we want are very different yeah no that's uh, absolutely true um and i'm i'm always heavily influenced by especially the indie and small press um um, publishing uh, scene. I think that that people come up with some amazing ideas. A lot of the stuff that's in Cortex Plus that's now in Prime, and the stuff that is in Prime now that wasn't even in there before, is inspiration. And I think we all do this as designers. I mean, there's folks who have been inspired by the work I've done in the past. I've been inspired by work people have done in the past. We we have that kind of collegial atmosphere. I think that goes on as long as you understand that none of us are trying to rip anyone else off um and it's Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a uh homage love letter sort of like inspiring thing then the the feel Mm -hmm. is really good and you still have to write this stuff you can't just copy and paste things straight into your book otherwise it's pretty obvious but yeah Yeah. (laughs) Uh, that's part of my feel of this is that i wanted to create a kind of like an avenue for people to bring their own content into cortex and that was a huge deal because the the diy and and um sort of small press indie publishers really want to do things with their own ideas and sometimes they don't have the time or the interest in coming up with their own rule systems from scratch um Mm mm-hmm I think that's why you see so many people using D and D, even the old basic set stuff and things. It's just what they know. It's easy for them to do it, and right. then they can go put out like you know some wacky module, or they can make a sort of a cool ass setting that's based on something with the serial numbers filed off, and that's cool. Mm-hmm. And that was what I kind of wanted Cortex Prime to be, um, kind of like the lingua franca, I guess, for a new bunch of people doing things their own way while also adding back into the community. So if they make something cool, they can throw it into the Cortex Creator Studio, which is a thing we have planned. And then although they will keep all of their own IP in their setting and it's all theirs, anything that's rules-wise that they make, they can contribute to the greater community who can then use that in their own stuff. So almost at the inverse of a license, it's like you keep all the stuff that's actually fiction and a narrative that's yours and it, you can continue to make it yours while, you know, hey, I just used this cool Lego brick. I want you to have this Lego brick. Why don't you play with hmm. it? Right. That's very cool. I Well, I know that, um, you know, on the One Shot Network, um, the Couriers Call podcast just switched to be using Cortex Prime for their system. They were using um, a version of Fate Accelerated mm-hmm. last season, um, and they just switched to use Cortex this season because they felt like it had a little bit more of a – um, a little bit more of those building blocks for them to work with. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's only a couple episodes so far, but I'm excited to see um, how it works for them compared to using something else. So I'm mm-hmm. very excited. And it's worth noting too, I think that um, I go way back with a lot of these people. I mean, I was um, a part of the same kind of small community of folks that included Fred Hicks and Rob Donahue and, and those folks who worked on Fate and we're all old friends. And the reason some things look similar, I think in the long run is, a, they also worked on some of the games I made back in the Cortex Plus days, so you'll see them in leverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same way Josh Roby worked on Smallville, and they've they've done some things in this since then that you know draw on the same ideas that Smallville had. I think mm-hmm. the key to that is that um, we think similarly about games. We we love the mm-hmm. things about games that we all have in common, and so you'll see a lot of that come out. I think that's a thing that's quite f- common. 
I think if you have communities who are sort of bashing ideas and throwing things around, you'll see similar ideas come out of them. And that's what I think is wonderful about game design in general. Yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, there are certain like concepts that we all kind of grab from. But like if the three of us sat down and played a game and then went to each go make our own game, um, what we pulled from that original one Mm -hmm. would be different. Um, Yeah you know, based on like what we want our own games to do. So I think that, you know, a lot of us pull from that same sort of like pile of concepts. We just take away different things. And so you can kind of see where stuff starts to branch off and become its own thing. But like, we're all, we're all still working in that same, you know, like that same bucket of Lego pieces. We've just grabbed different ones, you Mm -hmm. know? (laughs) Um, But yeah, you can see where a lot of things, it's cool to watch the evolution of games because you can see where, where those things came from. And it's just, fun to watch people make new things out of them all the time absolutely so this is the part that we talk about like basic terms and concepts usually uh for the games Mm -hmm. uh that we need to kind of understand before we get into character creation yeah um there's there's a lot of pieces to cortex right quite a lot (laughs) so so we put that we we put down a preliminary list of things that we could talk about um but uh, I think I just want to ask you in general, like, is there anything that that's just different that we might need to know before we dive into uh, a mashing together our own system and then creating characters? Or is it something that we can kind of get a hold of as we go through the process? I think you'll get things as they go along. I mean, the, the, the most intimidating thing about this book probably is looking at it and going, well, which things do I pick to go into my game? Do I pick all of them? And if I do, what will that look like? And the answer is a mess. Um, <laughs> Don't uh, do that. <laughs> you know, um, I like to tell people it's sometimes there's two ways of doing this. Go completely hog wild and, and crazy and then chop off the bits that don't work anymore. Or start with the familiar and the comfortable and add things on that may be you know, interesting to you. And the mm-hmm. latter is most likely the way that most people should go. Although, if you're anything like my wife, who just goes completely out to the fringe land of weirdness first and then comes slowly back, uh, that's <laughs> that's just what she does. Um, I think that a, a basic term or concept we want to sort of really nail down first is this idea of traits. And... They are what every other game would call um, ability scores or stats or feats or anything. It's anything that in the game that is rated with a die. Mm. So, and the dies go from D4 to D12. And the important thing about the rating is that it doesn't always reflect strength or potency or, or effectiveness necessarily, but how important or significant that trait is compared to other traits like it. So if I have a mm. D12 in something, not only am I probably better in that thing or stronger or faster or whatever, but I'm also more likely to be using it because it's my signature aspect of my character. It's, it's my, my spotlight, I guess you could call it. So high, high die ratings mean they will be more useful for me to succeed in the game, but they're also where the camera is most focused on me. And the D4s mm-hmm. are going to be the areas where I'm going to have a lot of trouble and I think I don't either my character doesn't care about them as much or they're deliberately low because I want to get in trouble with them. And <laughs> because of the way the system works, as you'll probably find out, uh, rolling ones on your dice bring you uh, problems, like they bring you complications or, or other kinds of things. And But they also give you plot points to spend later on. So you kind of don't want to always be using your best dice because you want to earn plot points to succeed later at doing awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Um, All right. So I would also say here, let's make some people, but (laughs) we have to make a system first, right? (laughs) Well, uh, I think a good idea um, would be to sort of come up with something that you two want to make characters in. What kind of game are we even talking about? And when I ask that question, usually I tell (laughs) folks to look at, you know, this big list of, of uh, genres and ideas that we've got in the in the game. Uh, I think it's Prime Settings, I believe the setting uh, stuff is. And I helpfully broke down everything in, that I could think of 
and I said pick three and add cortex to it, which um, in this case uh, you could do pick two. I think it would be perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. So, uh, so I'm looking at the the pick three and add cortex to it page, uh, which is 128 in the book, uh, and there's a lot of good uh, genre categories here. Now, um, a running thing lately, apparently, is um, I'm really big into magical girls, and <laughs> Amelia's really big into uh, the necromancy and blood magic sort of stuff. Um, I think you say lately as if it hasn't been going on for I know, three it's years. Been, it's been from the beginning, but it's been it's been kind of a pattern lately. Um, it's been getting so, worse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm seeing like uh, like magical girls is a subsection of superheroes, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and then uh, necromancy, blood magic type stuff would be probably high fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um. And really, we could throw high school in there at the same time, right? Um, just to throw complete the genre, I guess you could say. Sure. You might even um, say it's part of the dark fantasy, actually, because of the whole uh, focus on, on... I mean, what I'm hearing from you is yeah. something like a, a version of, I don't know, like Death Note, but with more more magic in it necessary, or maybe not in the same modern-day setting, right? So you're talking about yeah. something with magical girls and necromancy but when and how is it so like that's the question i'll ask you yeah mm-hmm. oh man i haven't thought about death note in forever oh wow <laughs> wow <laughs> that's a callback um so so what when? superhero dark fantasy high school well okay so we did superheroes yeah recently so we should like i feel like maybe roll that back roll it back just a little bit just a little less super powered okay right like we don't have to go full superpowers, right? Right. Um, because you can. I, I'm imagining you throw like the superhero genre in there, and it's not like okay, everybody's got superpowers, uh, sure. unless you want it that way, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, Agents of Shield's still superheroes, kind of. That's true. true. Um, it's just that everybody who's on the team, mostly of them, are just super spy people. Yeah. I mean, I think the big question here, Ryan, is just like, what do you want? Like the, I mean, because you can pull in as many other things as you want. I think the question is like, what is the big yeah. thing? Um, Let's just do Dark Fantasy High School then. That sounds oh, okay. pretty good. I mean, you can do magical girl stuff because they are literally magical girls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it has the word <laughs> fantasy in it. So no, I mean, maybe they're just like kind of goth now. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> to be expected, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Optimistic right. goths. So right. it'll be fine. Okay. You need, dark, dark fantasy high school. There's got to be that one token character who is not goth and therefore sticks out. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Absolutely. That'll be Ryan. I'm sure it, I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Dark fantasy high school. Um, I love that a lot. So what's the, what's the next thing that we have to take care of now that we selected kind of our overall genres? Um, what do we have to do to, to solidify it? Well, the next thing that you do is you try to pick two, at least two prime sets. And uh, much like how we try and pick, you know, one or two or two or more concepts to be the, the sort of the genres of this mashup, we also want to pick out what the two core trait sets that you have in the game, whether it's skills and attributes or powers and relationships or anything like that that form Mm -hmm. the basis of every dice pool that you put together. So anything you do, whether it's a test or a contest or anything else, is going to involve you taking a die from uh, one prime set and a die from another prime set and add them together in a pool and rolling them. And that kind of makes a huge uh, difference to your game because your focus on which trait sets you want to use at the big list we've got will also then determine kind of how the game feels. Um, Yeah. If it's very skill heavy, it'll feel like a game that has skills. Um, and if it's all about values and relationships, it won't feel like that at all. Oh, that's really interesting. Because um, I think uh, it, it feels like powers is kind of uh, kind of defined both uh, yeah. both of the things we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, like there, right? magic 
Right. Um, yeah, magic and being the powers. And, I assume. Yeah, mm-hmm. and magic transformations and magic uh, abilities and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I think powers would be really interesting. Um, but then if you want to add like some real good uh, magical girl stuff on top of that, like relationships would be really interesting. I think. Yeah, I was gonna say like just knowing us, relationships has to be one of them. Like that's. Yeah. I don't really care <laughs> what else <laughs> relationships has to be one of them. Yeah. So I think powers and relationships would be really interesting to, to kind of roll with. Yeah. yeah. I would also suggest something, and that is to consider the idea of having powers be something that is a prime set, but not the only other one. Look, the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up is because if there's an occasion when you can't think of a power you have that would apply to a situation, you're stuck a bit. Mm. Oh, Yeah. And so you can it always be, think of a relationship because, you know, am I doing this for this person? Am I doing this against this person? Um, yeah. And that's where you start yeah. having that issue. Because, like, uh, one of the big tropes of uh, magical girls is you don't have powers half the time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, you you can't have your powers until you transform, basically. Right. Um, I, I wonder if, like, attributes and relationships uh, would make sense for those, like, times when you're not when the powers don't apply yeah um i would also look at things like affiliations which is often that's about you know what kind of situation am i in that i do better at and the ones that i don't do well at and affiliations come from marvel heroic where i first had them used where there was solo buddy and team and so mm-hmm. when you were in, if you were by yourself, you'd use your solo die. If you were within a team, you'd use your team die. And if you had one friend, it was a buddy die. And there's other ways you could look at this too. You could do it in terms of, um, we've done one recently where we had uh, court, uh, the dungeon, the wild, and so forth as like place sort of types. And every time uh-huh. you were there, you would use the die that was most, because you were affiliated with that specific kind of thing. Yeah, the other, oh, that's really interesting. The other option is you could use values, and the one I, I've never really done anything with before, but I've always wanted to, is using the seven deadly sins as your values, and oh. you could rate them in that way. So that you'd have, and this is in the actual um, rule book on page 60, it's got uh-huh. envy, gluttony, greed, lust, pride, sloth, and wrath, and you would, put, <laughs> you would have ratings in those. <laughs> And then you decide from dice pool to dice pool, am I being motivated here by being mad at them or am I being motivated by my envy? And Okay, yeah. so I want to do that because I, I was re-listening to our Sentinel Comics episode, Ryan, mm-hmm. and you were talking about like your inf- infernal powers and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I want a magical girl team <laughs> that is the seven deadly sins. <laughs> Ooh. So like, I think that we should do that. That sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, let's go ahead with that then. Let's do um, it. So, this so we'll, we'll do what values in relationships, yeah, um, and powers in relationships, and powers right? as well. Yeah, yeah, with powers kind of as a side set. You could even do, um, and this is just throwing this out there. Every single Cortex game does have distinctions as well. Distinctions is one that's kind of automatic because you have three of those, and they're all rated at D eight. But they also provide the elevator pitch for your character. Oh. Um, and a little bit like, you know, what are the three things about my character that if I told you what they were, you'd know pretty much all about me. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you're looking at someone, and if you sold someone, I am a, um, oh, what's a good example? Like a Scarlet Witch uh, from the MCU. Mm-hmm. She could say I'm, you know, a, 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 a War survivor. Um, I am a, a student of a student of chaos, and I am um, well. What else? Uh, I'm trying to think of something else that I I used to have her as my basis for everything, and now I've forgotten it. But <laughs> um, you may find this familiar if you played a lot of Fate. They seem similar to aspects. But the difference yeah, okay. it, it definitely yeah. sounds that way, right? The difference is that you uh, in in this game they don't do the same thing necessarily. They can be used um, as a D4 instead of a D8, and you get a plot point for doing it, which is kind of the equivalent of a uh, compel, but Ooh. it's it's uh, self self created. So I would nice. I would say that in this case, you can also um, provide 
the idea of each of these three distinctions comes into a certain kind of category. So like for hammerheads, we have one, which is what was my, what was my life before? Um, what is my personality trait or, and, and what is my approach to doing things? And you can use those as sort of inspiration for coming up with what you do. Okay. So I think in this case, you could say, okay, well, if we're going to use distinction, then it's a uh, magical girl, dark fantasy high school. One is, you know, what kind of, what was my family like? You know, what's, what's the distinction based about my family and where I came from? Because it could be mm -hmm. very different from, from character to character. One might be, what is a, how do I, you know, go about doing things at school and in life? And the third one could be, you know, what is my magical uh, specialty slash um, quirk? And mm -hmm. you could then use that as the basis for power stuff. Okay. Yeah, I can see that working very well. So where am I from? What's my approach to things? And then what is the source of my power? Okay. I wrote them all down already. <laughs> if you're thinking it through, Ryan, I've got... Cool. I made notes. <laughs> I've got notes too, so okay. <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, all right. I just wanted to make a note of the uh, values of uh, seven deadly sins. That sounds cool. Okay. So we've got uh, some more building blocks uh, put into it. Uh, what What is next? Well, now we have to figure out... Um if there's anything specific rules wise that you'd like to have featured in the game outside of characters. So the usual way of doing this is by default, we would take it so that the game includes tests and contests as the way we resolve most things. You can mm -hmm. change it to a more traditional action and reaction way of doing it, um, which I think is sometimes useful for people playing a lot more of the I don't know, techno thriller, a sort of more procedural kind of thing where they don't really want to be as loosey goosey. But I think in this case, we'd, we'll stick with the tests and contests. It makes the most sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Then, um, I don't know, there's not a lot of other things we want to worry about at this point. I think you want to consider um, what sort of, what is it that people do in this game? Uh, what is it that they do? What's the game about? That's a good question. Yeah, I feel like that's on you. This is your genre. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, magical girl genre is all about surviving high school uh, mm -hmm. and relationships with friends uh, while also trying to save the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and usually you're saving the world um, outside of the eye of society, right? So like all this weird stuff is happening to society. Nobody really acknowledges it after the fact. Right. It just goes back to normal. Like just it never go, everything goes back to normal. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about it. Um, but then, you know, the next big bad comes along and you have to save the day again. Mm -hmm. um, or there's like, a, oh, there's a new candy shop that showed up and suddenly everybody's life force is drained because they went to the candy shop that was owned by these bad guys that that are draining their energy for nefarious purposes. Hate when that happens. I know. Um, <laughs> sugar, it will get you every time. Um, so yeah, I, I like uh, balancing the mundane and the uh, the heroic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is is probably a big goal, and then right. also um, having utilizing those relationships in order to strengthen your resolve when fighting the enemy effectively. Awesome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing too is that like those enemies need to be able to be like larger than life kind of yeah like you know not like, so much like just like you know potentially like, world ending uh type enemies right yeah Perfect. Every time. Are, uh, <laughs> and usually a hierarchy right so there's like one big bad that really could take care of everything if they wanted to but they always send their little minions to mm -hmm. go first and the minions always mess up because right. they're not strong enough. And then eventually the big bad steps in. Right. Eventually uh, there's that, a season finale. And then. Yes. Yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. there's a big fight. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I know a good way of handling that. And that would be if you use uh, the Doom Pool in this game. Hmm. And you used it to reflect the uh, growing sense of dread and, and worry and concern that's building up. 
and that gets used in place of difficulty rolls for the uh, GM. They roll the Doom Pool whenever anyone's doing a test, and the more the bigger the Doom Pool gets, it ends up having a bunch of dice in it, and you roll that as a pool of dice. And the bigger the Doom Pool gets, the more things get troubling for your heroes and characters. I love that. The GM can spend dice out of the Doom Pool to summon, basically, or activate uh, game moderator characters, which would, in this case, be minions and things. So I think the GM could feel like, okay, well, once the Doom Pool is big enough, I'm going to start throwing things at the players and using it. Uh, And at the very end, it obviously will manifest itself as whatever big bad you want it to be. That sounds perfect. I love that. That's perfect for what we need here. Absolutely. I like that we're just saying things to you and you're like, okay, let's make that into a game. <laughs> we'll just say nonsense and then you can tell us how to make it coherent. <laughs> Always good. Absolutely. I don't know. So far it's proof that like this can do anything because we can just make stuff mm-hmm. up. I love it. Okay. So All right. what else do we need to define? Um, I think that's probably it for now. Um, did you want any additional traits that, that don't necessarily always get used, but would be helpful to use? Like um, one of the ones that I often think is helpful is resources and skill, uh, not skills, specialties, which is a kind of skill, but um, only gets used whenever it's appropriate. Those are both fun. Uh, the other thing is assets, signature assets. These are things that your character has as part of your um, who you are and what you do, but they're not in, innate. They're like a magical staff or it's a suit of armor or it's a friend of mine who is always there doing things as a henchman or something. And mm. having those would be fun because then you can split your character creation uh, stage between a few of those. If you want to load up on signature assets, you can have them. Someone else mm-hmm. might load up on specialties instead because they kind of can be used in a similar fashion, only, you know, different ways. Um, I mean, I kind of like the concept because I know, Ryan, when we did Chimera, there were like a couple of things that you had, like moves in the Magical Girl playbooks Mm -hmm. that were very like, you know, you can only use this like once or twice or whatever. Yeah. Um, But really defined the characters. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like I think the Mask playbook really... Mm-hmm. Whatever that one was. Yeah, the, there's one or two that Senda picked that I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Resources are fun because they're kind of a, a pool of dice that are um, spendable, and they will, and you use them up um, mm-hmm. until they get refreshed somehow. And you can kind of define them on your own terms. You could say that my resources is like four d six of necromantic magic, and whenever mm-hmm. I'm using necromantic magic, I can take some of them out and spend them. And if I spend them, the way it works is you can spend as many of them as you want. You roll them all together and the, you pick the highest one and add it to your actual total. Not It's not part of your dice pool. It's on top of what you just rolled. So it's actually very oh, wow. potent. But if you roll more than, than one, you're spending them all and you don't get to keep all of them, right? So oh, okay. mm-hmm. it's kind of a risk thing, right? So if you have 46... Oh, I do love a good... Risk. Yeah, you might roll just one, knowing you might get a one, which would be terrible. <laughs> uh, you might roll two, hoping to get for one of them to be higher than the other one, and so on. Mm-hmm. They can also be more than d6s. You could actually have pretty powerful resources as you, if you had a long term game. Mm-hmm. And that way you could have, you know, master. Uh, I'm, this is my last year at Dark Fantasy High School, and I've got d10s in my necromantic power, so watch out. Yeah, I do really like that. I like the idea of like, like a, a resource that I mean, I guess like is technically renewable, but like uh-huh. you know can sort of dwindle down, especially in relation to like dark magic or something, uh-huh. which tends to be like somewhat draining. Yeah, it's it's usually. very good for both genres where it, like the dark magic is draining, and then the like the magical girl stuff is like uh, getting extra oomph because you're in. in pulling inspiration from your allies or you know Mm -hmm. whatever Mm -hmm. right but also like the idea too that you are you know like you can only spend so much time doing magical girl things because you're you have to go back home and do your homework right like you can't just forever do Mm -hmm. (laughs) this thing actually Um, 
I just thought of this idea that you have to spend time in the mundane world to refresh your magical powers it would be a really cool way of doing it. So yeah, that would be, yeah. yeah. You have to play out a couple okay. scenes of ordinary life in order for it to charge up. All I right. like that a lot. Yep. Let's do that. Cool. I think we've got everything you need to make some uh, terribly uh, grief stricken young people. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, then now I can say it, right? Uh, shall we make some people? Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Let's make some people. All right. So now we've got this this wonderful base of a game here. Uh, what do we need to do first to to make our people? Do I need dice for character creation? No, for you this don't. One? I mean, unless okay, you want to just roll them and annoy people. As the, as the <laughs> no, I put them away. I like cleaned off everything that I sat down and was like, dice, shoot. Um, so, there okay. are three <laughs> forms of character creation described in the book, and they're only examples of how to do it. Um, there's, there's infinite ways you could decide to make characters because your game may want to be spend do points to make this or play through a uh, sort of a pregame kind of uh, pathways sort of setup. Um, mm -hmm. or even just, I want to take an archetype like a playbook and spin a couple of points and then make it mine. Um, in this example, I don't think we have a pathway set up made because we've just made this up now mm -hmm. and we don't have archetypes. So I was going to suggest that we just go straight to a scratch built method, which is pretty easy. Yeah, may okay. as well. So, uh, with that in mind, if you want to look at what we've decided on as our prime traits, we went with values, relationships, and distinctions. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to maybe put resources in there. Yep. we got mm -hmm. a smattering of powers, possibly. Yep. Because, the to be honest, I think the resources might do the trick for powers. Because you that could makes then, sense. You yeah, could we can spend those to do powers. Be a lot more narrative about it, too, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, if you're going to have values... You assign dice to them, and these values are the seven deadly sins. Mm. So I'll I'll uh, read them out again for those of you who want to know what they are. Uh, so envy, gluttony, greed, lust, pride, sloth, and wrath. Awesome. So with values, you're going to have um, uh, d8s and three of them. Okay. And D6 for the rest. Oh, okay, perfect. And you can step values up by stepping others down. Uh, you can do that once. Oh. So you could step one of the 8s up to a 10 by stepping one of the 6s down to a 4. Or you could save them as 888 6666. Okay. And I guess that's worth noting, uh, Cam. Uh, feel free to create a character with us. Uh, because uh, it'd be awesome to have a team of three doing this. Uh, I would do that. However, my brain right now is focused on trying to figure this out. <laughs> <but> I, <laughs> I can certainly talk about um, a character who we have, who I could make up later if you really felt like it. And that would be good. Oh, sure. Okay, Ryan, what are you gonna what are you gonna put your T eights in? Oh goodness. It might help a, first if you decided who your character's gonna be before we even went any further, though, right? What kind of character are you thinking about? Mm hmm. Gosh, I I have to be kind of the um the optimistic one, right? Well, right. That's why I'm wondering where you're gonna put this stuff. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, because I'm very comfortable with like wrath, envy, pride. Like, I mean, that's very fitting for you, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm okay, like moving. Mm -hmm. Other things too. Mm -hmm. If you wanna. So uh, I'm 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 thinking. Like, um, cause like you, you think of the seven deadly sins, right? And you think, uh, like the, I guess the worst, uh, quote unquote, uh, traits of humanity, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why that, you're having a really difficult time here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm like, I can tell of, you my top three, no problem. And Ryan's like, yeah, but what if like, we weren't that bad? Maybe no, like we were the, like nice people, but I'm I'm trying to think of like what an optimist would uh would throw uh their their self themselves into like of uh kind of like a driven sort of force. Um so maybe maybe greed 
might be one I of think them. Greed, pride. I think you could do gluttony pretty easily pride. because you could like you know like I, I think of gluttony and I also think of like hedonism and like you know. And mm-hmm. sloth is apathy and laziness, and so you know if they're an optimist, but they don't seem to care that much about you know the world because they think it's all fine. Being a little bit of a, a, a sort of rose-colored glasses individual is, I would say, sloth would fit into there too. That makes I sense. I mean, also you could just be like apathetic about being evil. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very fair. Ryan's like, that's me. <laughs> I, yeah, we'll put it in sloth. That's fine. Um, and if we step one down, we can step a d6 to a d4. Correct. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And that would be good because in that sense, um, what that means for a value is I'm really not into this. Whereas a D10 is I'm all over this thing. Right. And a D8 is this is definitely on my radar. Okay. So I think that's where you look at it in terms of uh, am I going to find myself more motivated by this thing than this other thing? And if it's a D4, it's like this is never going to really motivate me at all. Mm Mm-hmm. And the reason you still have it in the game is because you may find yourself in a situation where it makes the most sense for that to be the reason why you would do something, but you yeah. just aren't into it. Okay. That makes sense. I'm stuck between pushing Wrath up to a D8 Ooh. or pushing one of my others to a D10 uh, and then stepping down Envy to a D4. What are your other three again, the, the D8s that you already had? Uh, greed, pride, and sloth. Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by a character who has a D10 and sloth. Hmm. I think I can picture that. Okay. Yeah, we'll go with that. D10 and sloth. Because why not? <laughs> <laughs> I could just see uh, this person being like, everything's going to work out fine. It's just don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. I put a D8 in lust, in wrath, and pride. <laughs> Lovely. You'd be the greatest person to have around you at school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Call to action. Yeah, like that. I honestly don't know exactly where this episode leaves off, but I do know that this series goes some really great places, and I can't wait to hear the rest of it. Cortex Prime is a fascinating system slash toolkit, and we really just scratched the surface of what it can do here. If you want to hear it played, you can always check out the Courier's Call podcast here on the OneShot Network. It is a family-friendly show, and they just switched to using Cortex Prime for their second season. A reminder that September is International Podcast Month. You can find more info at internationalpodcastmonth.com or on their Twitter at PodMonth. Once again, a sincere thank you to all of you for being patient with us this week and for the next few weeks. We absolutely would not love making this show nearly as much as we do without everyone listening and without the excellent and supportive interactions that we have with all of you. You absolutely make it worth it. So thank you. We love you. Stay safe. Drink water. Please get vaccinated if you can. And we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at LordNeptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. 
Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like All My Fantasy Children. Each week, Aaron Katana Saez and Jeff Stormer take a listener submitted prompt and, using some of their favorite tabletop RPGs, create an original fantasy character. Along the way, they share laughs, stories, verbal hugs, and populate a shared universe one story at a time.